Discovery Centre um, is our store, which was purpose built in 2007, and it's where our non designated archaeology archives are stored. Uh, we're still accepting archaeological archives, but the archaeology department is temporarily closed whilst our curator has a baby, which is totally understandable. Um, about two years ago, um, I started work as maternity cover for the Curator of Archaeology. Um, and uh, one of the first events that I went to um, was March 2013's Archaeological Archives Forum in Birmingham. Uh, and what uh, struck me, which loads of people were here at at the same time. Uh, and what struck me in my early career um, enthusiasm um, was that how archaeologists um, Seemed to, seemed to be perceiving the fact that um, people thought that once the greater archive got to the museum, it ended up in the skip, the, 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 the skip of the, the shelving, the intellectual skip of, you know, it's just there, no one's doing anything with it. Um, and that there was obviously this need for archives to kind of work for themselves, to be documented, um, for researchers to, to look at. Um, but what I really felt was there was this total focus on the fact that we need to have our archives available for researchers to work at, work at and to work on. Um, but, and we were saying, you know, no one pays enough attention um, to them, so we can't get the funding to digitise our archives so that researchers can, can, um, can access them. And one of the ways that I thought we might be able to sort of work around that and to, to raise the issues around um, archaeological archives uh, more publicly um, would be through our family and through our adult learning program uh, so rather than saying this is the archaeology it's incredibly interesting saying this is the process this is incredibly interesting this has an intrinsic value uh, not just in you being good community archaeologists or good family or archaeologists or people who are just interested in you know things that come out the ground, um, but it also had that very important point of saying that your archaeology, like Duncan said first thing this morning, it starts in some cases when you get to the door of the museum. Uh, so I really wanted to develop some workshops that would illustrate that to people who weren't familiar with these more complicated uh, processes. However, I didn't want to dumb it down either. It's not a case of doubt. This is why I really wanted this presentation, essentially. <laughs> um, I didn't want to, I didn't want to dumb it down. I didn't want it to become a case of, you know, come and see our archaeological archives, see our secrets. What have I got under my, you know, museum storage, sliding racks, you know, um, sheepskin coats. Um, so it was finding that intellectual balance between saying, you know, it's very complicated and important, but also uh, saying it's not just coming and looking at the same two Saxon brooches, for example, you know, there's a lot of variety. Uh, and that there's also as well, there's, you know, it's really important that people know that this is the kind of thing that a lot of thought is put into and that there are a lot of intellectual decisions that are being made. Um, I think people don't realise how lengthy the process can be and how much thought we all put into it of having a workable archive. Um, so um, we do, of course, uh, have lots of bling uh, in uh, Leeds' collections. Uh, we have... Uh, these are just some pretty objects at uh, the West Yorkshire Hoard, uh, you see there, lovely, nice rings. Um, and we have basically the collections kind of in, in two halves. There's our historic collection that was um, collected by the Leeds Philosophical and Literary Society in the 19th century. Uh, and then we have a lot more uh, recent material from current uh, uh, excavations or more recent 20th century excavations. Um, what I didn't, sorry, I'll just go back. What I didn't want to say was when we were running these workshops, was come and look at the same material. I really wanted it to be um, sort of live, I don't know, you would call it, my my friends in the community team call it co-curation, so I'll, I'll go with that. But, but it's for it to be live sort of co-curation of you know the new archives that are coming into uh, the museum. Uh, so the first very small archive that we worked <coughs> with as an experiment, um, I worked with our education uh, officer on this whole project um, and her, she kind of summed it up in 
You mean we're going to tell people about a really boring process using really boring objects that no one's going to possibly be interested in? Uh, and I said, yeah, that's exactly what we're going to do. <laughs> but everyone's going to be really interested in it because it's really interesting. Um, so, the, uh, so the archive that we used as a test to see uh, whether this would work or not um, was um, a dig from Monkbridge Ironworks in Leeds, so industrial archaeology. Uh, not the same as Egyptology um, in the public's eye. Um, the two objects in there were two, uh, I don't know, two kilo uh, lumps of uh, industrial slag. Um, there was excavation paperwork, there were the site drawings and maps, uh, and there were some photographs that were digital and on paper. So first of all, you're introducing people to the idea that the archive is so much more beyond the object um, immediately. Uh, and again, we really wanted to impress upon people that there's there's so much more than you know the pottery shed that you, you might be touching uh, and how did we do it the kind of the style of the workshop that we did I'm delivering this like a lecture uh, if you'd come to the the, the event um, it was much more interactive uh, we were moving around uh, we were trying to be very um, engaging and, and what we basically did was we greeted everyone at the front door and we said, you are archaeologists, you have just given us this archive, what do we do with it now? Uh, it was a discussion-based uh, and movement-led workshop, essentially. We have a, a huge store, our warehouse, we have that whole space to use, let's use it. Um, there's no need to put people who are coming for a family activity because of the Festival of British Archaeology, to put them in a classroom uh, at all. Uh, so, so uh, obviously, uh, we said, well, what do you do? If you were an archaeologist, what would you do when you arrived at a museum to make sure that, you know, you knew that they had the objects? And we introduced them to the idea of the object entry form, um, which kind of when you're greeted at the front door and you said, you know, fill in this piece of paperwork, but it's all about kind of how you deliver it to people. So it's saying that you need to ensure that the museum knows it's got it and it knows what it's got. Uh, and the example is, uh, this is a robot uh, that we uh, accessioned a couple of years ago of Optimus Prime. Um, but it's that idea of from the point of entry, you know what you've got, you know what you're, what you're, what you're getting. Uh, and then how do we know who owns it? Um, again, this idea of ownership, when you're kind of, you can illustrate this in a variety of different ways, you know, um, with the young people or the different groups that we were working with. But we're saying it's really important that you, you transfer the ownership so that you, you know, you as the archaeologist who's, who's, who's dug it, you might think you own this object, you know, who should be owning this object? And we always say um, in our service, you know, the people who own our objects are the 800,000 people who live in Leeds. Uh, so they've got one and, a, one and two thirds each. Um, it's a bit of competition. But it's that idea of empowering people to you know, take control of the, the collections that they own um, and to, to kind of get inspiration from that. I mean, I find that amazing. I pay my council tax. I, I think it's brilliant that you know, there's almost two objects in the collection that are, that are funded by, by me. It's not just bins. Um, uh, and then it's not just bins should not be like the tagline of this whole day I don't think <laughs> um, uh, and then it's uh, and then we, we did move into kind of our education centre and we went through um, a lot of different activities uh, including conditions checking so we got all our participants to do their own conditions reports including drawing a, drawing a picture of uh, industrial slag or we also had some shells had only two objects. Uh, they looked at all of the archive as well, um, and when we want the one of the boys who was seven, he said, "I didn't know archaeology was this much." He was he kept picking up the, the 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 DVD that had all the digital images on, and he was like, "I didn't know this was arch this isn't art." And he one he he really struggled with the idea that archaeology wasn't just a thing, um, which I think is really interesting because he's an interested child, brought by his parents. He'd watch Time Team, he, you know, and he still was kind of struggling with that. Um, we did some cleaning. Uh, so uh, this isn't one of our participants. This is someone who um, 
I could get a good picture of and we had signed the appropriate forms. Uh, but we, <laughs> so we talked about, you know, do you need to clean these, this, uh, this archive? Do you need, need to clean this, uh, the, uh, these uh, samples of slag? And they, they, they sort of said, oh, actually, no, we don't. We don't want to introduce any, we don't want to wash them. We don't want to introduce any water. Um, but so that people would have a go, and so it's more of an immersive uh, workshop, we have some uh, minerals and, and shells and things that, we can just use for people to get an idea of conservation and wind the cotton wool around the cocktail stick and you know have some practice with that uh, and then um, we talked about packaging um, <laughs> uh, um, I mean we, we touched on the science of the different materials of objects as well when we were talking about um, conservation and cleaning before uh, and then how much fun can you get out of packaging uh, when you've got a group of seven-year-olds loads is it fish and chips uh, are you making lots of puffs you know where do you where do you put the most tissue paper in the box oh you put it all on top but what if I drop it on the floor? And it was just, I think you forget that these things that you do every day in your life, for some people, they are just extraordinary insights into, you know, one, one mum said, who wasn't paying that much attention, I'll be honest, <laughs> suddenly perked up and she sort of said, oh, this is really useful because we're moving house in a couple of months. <laughs> and I was like, absolutely, transferable skills, you know. <laughs> um, uh, so, um, uh, and as well, you know, kind of from an educational point of view, you know, that's a, a, a multi-sensory aspect of the of the workshop. You know, um, I'll come on to the different participants that we, that we had um, over time on it, but you know, it's it's a, a different way of you know engaging people sensory with their senses. Um, and then we kind of oh, sorry that's. That hasn't shown up at all in my clever font use, um, but it has our classifications and our. Uh, it says uh, it's basically it says lead M dot D archaeology, and then the ones underneath are all the other collections that aren't important, uh, despite the fact they're designated world cultures, whatever. Um, uh, but basically, uh, we came on. We sort of kind of couch this in the phrase of like cracking the museum code because on the other objects that we look like people always say you know what do these numbers mean I know this was made in 2013 because it's got the number on it that kind of attitude <laughs> um that you know you get from, from teenagers in particular this isn't old oh let's just take that a step back um uh so yeah so basically decoding accession numbers um uh and what number would we uh be giving uh, to our object. Um, this was a sample that we used of um, some carbonised ap apples. Um, what's this telling us? No, these aren't from 1967. Um, <laughs> they're, they're much, much older. Um, but as well, um, the idea of keeping track um, of your objects. Um, so you've um, you've got your object, you know how to write an object number, you know what it is, you've conserved it, you've cleaned it, you own it, um, it's officially in your museum. Uh, what collection's it in? Uh, when did it come to the museum? What specimen is it? Uh, and then this, this is very simplified so that families could understand it, but then it's them getting to, to choose their own number for the archive. So I, ha I had given it a number, but I also led the participants to assign it to their own number, which was the same as mine. But so it would see, <laughs> basically I hoodwinked the public into doing what I wanted um, <laughs> so, um, so that they felt like they were making the decision, which is incredible because they, they were, you know, putting the number into to, to our database and this is a new object. It's, you know, it's, I, it's incredible. Anyway. Uh, and then what do you do with it? So you've got, everything's numbered, it's ready. Where does it go? Um, and that's where we're, I'm really fortunate. That I work a lot of the time out of our store. Um, so kind of, you know, what kind of box do you put it in? Do you put it in, in a cardboard box or in a plastic box? And again, with the with the, the samples of slag, that's a really good, um, you know, that was a really good example to work with people to say, well, actually a plastic box is better on this occasion. And what else do we need to put in? We know we don't want water, you know, all of those tiny things that we do every day. For some people, actually this whole process is a is a really amazing kind of intellectual discovery you know lots of thought lot of lots of decision making and by putting it into people's hands um they make the decisions it's not a it's not a tautology um uh, and then again uh 
where would you find it in our store? Uh, zone three um, is where we have uh, the largest amount of our roller racking. Um, here I am uh, some years ago <laughs> um, pointing out, uh, and the idea at this point was we had it numbered, we had it ready, and it's the, tr the treasure hunt in the store. Where are we going to put it? There's no point in putting it with our natural science collections. Uh, you know, what, what rack, what shelf, where's the gap? Uh, and then once you're in the store, then you get people talking immediately about, oh, it's very full. Oh, you've got a lot of things. And then through that discussion, you can say, well, yes, we do have a lot of things. Uh, we could have even more things if we had more money to build a bigger store. Uh, and then you get people to become, the whole point of the whole set of activities was to get people to become our advocates on this very precise topic. Um, and then, not so fast, you can't just put it straight in the store because it needs to be frozen. Uh, and then this is, this is the journey's end, or is it? Um, now you've done all your museum archaeology, now it's ready to, again, for people to... Um, it's on the shelf, it's ready for your researcher. But by having it ready for the researcher, um, you've actually empowered different groups of people to not just, you know, do the cataloguing for you, but to actually become advocates of the whole process in itself, um, which I think by doing it in a workshop setting, by making it, you know, more fun, we could have just got like a volunteer or an intern to come and do it, but by making it into something that's much more participatory, then, you know, instead of one person saying, oh, this is really interesting, amazing, it's a whole group of people who might have not encountered this kind of process before, saying, oh, actually, I thought I'd go there and be really bored and it was really interesting. Uh, yeah, museums, they, they need a lot more, they need a lot more room. Um, and also by couching it, so we, we ran it in various different ways. Um, we did it as a family workshop, which was brilliant because um, we had um, uh, some young people come, but we also get the parents always involved. When you come on a family workshop, it's not leave your children and sit in the corner. Um, you will be involved, uh, whether you like it or not. Um, uh, but because we were advertising this family workshop, we had loads and loads of inquiries from different community groups who wanted more information about, who were either currently engaged on community archaeology projects or who wanted to be or who, basically they wanted to skill up and they got in touch and they said oh can we do this workshop can we could, like is it just is it just for children and we said well no of course you can come and do it you know the, the, please do um and then we also um as well we went and ran it on some community excavations which was slightly trickier because uh, a room full of 60 people um <laughs> is um more difficult to be able to get them to understand the processes and the space in the store uh, so because they essentially had an experience like you're having which is very different to the one that uh, that we uh, uh, trialed and designed um, but what we did find was that by breaking it down into lots of stages um, the group who does there's a few um, pictures um, this was a group um, of people um, who had le ad who were adults who had learning difficulties. Yeah, um, and what we found was that by breaking it down into stages, you know, kind of every piece became manageable, and it wasn't you know it wasn't overfacing anyone. It wasn't this kind of they all left with different areas of the archaeological process that they had all found interesting. So there was something for everyone, you know, and. Uh, this guy, he really enjoyed uh, doing the archaeological drawings. Um, I was adamant that's going to be involved. But um, th that was the piece that he said, oh, actually, I find this really interesting. This is something that I would, you know, he, he, he accepted that he wasn't going to have a career, probably as an archaeological illustrator, but it was the piece of the, of the, of the jigsaw that he really enjoyed. Um, and he didn't have that knowledge beforehand. He didn't really know he really liked drawing before. So I think sometimes, kind of basically to sum up, I'll just run through these different people being interested. 
Um, one person tweeted, we love a bit of tweeting, uh, at the end of the day, um, who uh, had taken some pictures of, uh, uh, noted, you know, the paper archive, very obvious there, um, saying that archaeological archives rule okay, uh, which I think is really good, really good feedback. Um, but also kind of the, sort of the, the yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's, that's what we all should be sending at the end of the day. Um, but I guess that basically, what I really wanted to say was that, you know, it can be very frustrating working in the profession, but that in my experience with, with, with people um, in this one project that we've trialled um, with different yeah. groups and different members of the public, there is this intrinsic interest and this intrinsic value in talking about the process with people, and that people are interested and they do understand it and they do want to know more. Um, and I think that the more that people understand the processes uh, in museums or between contractors and museums, then the more they can become our advocates um, and I really think that 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 does work. Um, so yeah, hopefully, feel free to copy as well. You know, um, <laughs> do this, do this in all your establishments because um, it's worked really well for us in Leeds. Thanks.